Hi, today's Deer's video is going to be on data collection. We're going to give an overview of data collection and discuss some instruments to support your data collection. Our objectives for this session are to identify the variables that you'll need to answer your research questions, help operationalize those variable definitions and identify the types of measurements you'll need, identify some data collection strategies to support your research design, and plan for data management of your research design. Let's start first with a brief discussion on theory. When we talk about quantitative research, our theory in quantitative research is the interrelated set of constructs or variables formed into propositions or hypotheses that specify the relationship among variables, typically in terms of magnitude. When we talk about qualitative research, theory is the theoretical lens or perspective uh, that provides us an overall orienting lens for the study, especially when we investigate marginalized groups. Our theories are used to support our research. They can be used as an argument. They can provide discussion for the findings that you have. They might be a rationale for why you're choosing to do the research. They can provide a conceptual framework or the lens of how you're discussing your research. But ultimately, they also provide that theoretical perspective that helps tie what we're working on uh, to the underlying theory and education. There's lots of places where we can go to find theories that either might support our work or might help us understand our work inside of a larger context. So looking at computing education research like ICER, we can look in psychology or sociology, anthropology, education, and economics for a variety of theories that support what we might be finding in our research. We can also use our research to create our own theory, and that's one of the goals of the uh, DEERS project is to try to build up replicated research so that we can start supporting the idea of creating more theory in computing education research. So we start with research questions, we then get hypotheses, we start getting results, and as we build up replication, we can start coming up with theories that describe what's happening in our computing classrooms. Now, when we're talking about data collection, we have lots of considerations that we need to think about. We need to think about, are the data reliable? Are they a consistent uh, measurement? Are we using a consistent instrument? Are they valid? Are the uh, strengths of the conclusion something that will allow us to have a really strong finding uh, as our results? We also want to make sure that we're defining and operationalizing variables that make sense in terms of our research study. So we want to ask things about how do we measure X? How do we measure uh, students' attitudes? How do we measure uh, students' performance? So we want to understand what those measurements are so we can find a reliable and valid instrument or a re reliable and valid way to measure them. And when we talk about data collection instruments, there are some that are available. So attitudinal studies, there are validated attitudinal studies out there and you can reuse those. But you might also need to create your own instrument or you might need to identify your own measures uh, to actually measure what you're trying to address in your research question. Now there's all different types of measurements. Uh, there's self-report. These are measurements that we get through interviews, uh, through thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of the subjects under study. Uh, these are usually from surveys, interviews, and focus groups. We also have tests. These are things that measure individual differences in ability or personality. So you can think about these as being course artifacts. So how did the student do on a particular assignment? We can also think about this as things like Myers-Briggs. We also have behavioral measures. Uh, these measure behaviors through uh, systematic observation. It could be uh, textual, audio, video, recordings, uh, and these can be uh, obtained through observations, interviews, and focus groups. And finally, we can have physical measures. So these might be bodily activities such as heart rate, blood pressure, or eye tracking. And this does require special tools so we can track the, bio uh, the biometrics of our individuals participating in our research. So when we talk about data collection, we have three things that we need to be particularly concerned about. The first is, is it needed? So you wanna look at your research goal and your research questions. You wanna say, is the data that I'm collecting going to directly answer my research goal or question? Or will it help answer my research goal or question? So we really want to identify what is the most important data to help address our research goal or question. Now, a lot of people ask, why not just gather all the data, um, collect everything possible, because you might not know what would be interesting or useful. Well, it does make things harder to store. If you collect all the data, uh, you have a lot of things to go through. There's a lot of extra work to try to potentially bring that information together to actually answer your research question. 
If that data is in a protected category, it also adds to the complexity of storage and IRB approval. Collecting data through a survey is usually a much easier IRB approval than collecting biometric data, for example. You could also have survey fatigue. So the more things that you do that require your students to do something above and beyond uh, normal classroom instruction adds to fatigue in uh, participating in those types of, of, of things. So we want to minimize the surveys to the most important data we need. And then it looks a little bit like hypothesis hunting. So if you're collecting all the data, you might be trying to collect it so you then can find something interesting and then build a hypothesis from that. But that's not how we conduct research. You have the research question and the hypothesis first, and then you collect the data to address that hypothesis. And it could be the hypothesis is uh, proven true, it could be it's proven false, it could be null, and those are all fine results, but we want to drive our research forward from our research questions and hypotheses and not through just collecting all the data and trying to find something interesting. But also when we need to use our common sense to see whether or not what we're collecting is actually needed to address our research question. Next, we want to see is it reasonable or even possible to gather the data. Just because you want something doesn't mean you can get it. So we need to think about reasonableness in terms of our resources. Can I record uh, videos of all the students' interactions with TAs in a 250-person course over the course of a semester and actually extract all of that data? Or maybe I should look at a subset. Or maybe that's not the right type of data uh, to answer the research question that I'm asking. You also want to be mindful of the subject's time and resources. Uh, they don't need to fill out an extra 10 page survey just to participate in your study. You also want to try to identify uh, data that's going to be available without bias or confounding factors. So you want to make sure that you're collecting it kind of in the moment and not necessarily having a retrospective data that you're collecting. So asking someone who's a senior how they felt about something when they enter college may not give you reliable data. You also want to be very careful about collecting personally identifiable information or PII. So things like social security numbers isn't something you want to collect in a research study. Uh, and so you want to be careful about collecting the things that are going to help you address your, again, your research questions and then make sure it's something that's reasonable to get, it's reasonable to ask somebody to provide to you, and it's also reasonable in terms of your time. The next question is, is it ethical to gather the data? So we'll cover a little bit more about the ethics behind data collection in the IRB session. But the whole idea is that when we're collecting data, as per the Bradley report, we need to consider the ethics of the data we're collecting. So we want to make sure we maintain respect for persons. Uh, information about the study at comprehension level, you need to make sure when you provide an informed consent, you're not coercing the student into, or the subject into participating. We want to make sure that we're maximizing beneficence, which is maximizing benefits and minimizing possible harm. And we also want to look at justice. We want to make sure there is a fair distribution of the benefits and the burdens of the research study on the subjects. So again, we'll uh, talk about this again when we talk about IRB, and it's also part of your plan in your IRB. So when you submit your plan, you're going to need to talk about the data you're collecting, how you're going to collect it, how that data is going to be stored, how it's going to be analyzed. So all of this needs to be thought about beforehand as you're working on your research study. It's not just enough to come up with your research question and identify, I want to look at these artifacts. You need to plan out the entire process of running the study as part of your IRB. So here's some examples of things that were rejected. So gamification tools uh, are very popular in computing education research right now, um, but gamification tools have been rejected from IRB uh, when they put uh, participants into categories like bronze, silver, or gold, or platinum. So this idea of categorizing someone uh, could actually be detrimental to student performance in the class. So these gross level uh, items actually motivate students to participate. Well, some students wouldn't be motivated by this and it could be harmful. So the IRB rejected the study, believing it could have a negative effect on the students. Now, when we're looking at the instruments and the assessments that we use to answer our research questions, we want to make sure that they are good assessments, good instruments that can help us actually answer the question that we're trying to ask. 
And so you should validate your assessments and your instruments before you actually run them in a live study. And there's several ways you can do this. So you can have some people go through your assessments and do think aloud studies where they talk about what they think um, as they're answering these questions. That can help to make sure the wording is really crisp and that is actually trying to answer or ask what you really are trying to get to. You can also do content validity. Uh, you can make sure that you have the correct content. This can be done through a review of a panel of experts or you can do comparisons with other validated instruments. You could run pilot studies to make sure that you're, you're running the full uh, study background and that gives people an opportunity to test out your assessment, your intervention, your, uh, your study and get feedback about what went well, what didn't go well, so that when you actually go to collect the data for real, for your, your real study, you'll have um, a better idea of that things will work properly. You'll have more confidence in the instruments you're developed. And you have empirical studies of individual responses to actually establish validity and reliability of instruments that are survey instruments with Likert style questions or other types of multiple choice questions. So you can do construct validity uh, to make sure that the assessment actually measures the right concept. Again, think aloud interviews can help with this. Uh, for multiple choice questions, you can do item response theory. So you can identify uh, if you have strong item discrimination, difficulty, and low guessing probability for multiple choice questions. And you can also do comparisons with other information to, again, establish the validity and reliability of the tools that you're working with to answer your research questions. Now, where possible, you should use existing instruments, and there's a bunch of instruments that are available for you. This also allows for replication, so you can uh, usually replicate the, um, the construct uh, test of these instruments to make sure that you're seeing similar constructs in your results as well. So there's the Computing Attitudes Survey version 4, which is CAS. It's 26 questions that are focused on problem solving, and it has uh, subcategories on transfer, strategies, fixed mindset, and real-world connections. There's also the Computer Science Attitude, or CSA, uh, survey. There's 57 questions there, and it measures things along confidence, attitudes towards success, uh, male domain, usefulness, and effective uh, motivation for students. There's all sorts of other instruments available. Another one is the instrument to assess student self-belief in CS1. This is 19 questions. This is getting towards debugging, um, programming self-concept, programming interest, anxiety, and aptitude. And there's a whole bunch of other instruments. I've been compiling a list of validated instruments um, and I've shared this uh, document with you. It's still kind of a working document, but it's a CER instruments document under the uh, pound resources folder in our shared drive. And you can find even more validated instruments on csedresearch.org. So while these instruments are towards K-12, a lot of these instruments will also work in undergraduate uh, and possibly adult learner um, venues as well. Now, when you go to collect your data, there's lots of things that you need to consider. When will you collect your data? You need to create a timeline for your data collection uh, using your study design and your syllabus. You should give yourself reminders about, hey, I need to pull this data. I need to collect this. I need to run this survey. So you're ready to go at the start of the semester. You need to think about where you will collect your data. Will you collect it in your classroom? Are you going to have an interview location? Are you doing some other type of location? Or are you gonna be sending out an email? Are you gonna be asking for this during an online class? Uh, with the pandemic, we have lots of different ways that we're gonna be interacting with our students and you wanna be thinking about where you're gonna be collecting that data. You wanna think about how you're gonna collect your data. Are you going to require students to fill out some paper? Are you going to collect it electronically through a survey? Are you going to record them? Is it automated data collection of a grading system? You want to think about, is everything in place to do that data collection? Then you want to ask who will collect your data? Will you collect it as the instructor? Is it part of normal class activity? Or will somebody else administer the surveys and do the informed consent? So these are all questions you need to ask. And then you need to figure out where you're going to pull your demographics from. If you are going to break down your study by demographics, are you going to rely on self-report or are you going to pull data from the university or a combination of the two? And this brings us to the idea of privacy and confidentiality when working with research data. So privacy is defined in terms of having control over the extent, timing, and circumstances of sharing oneself. 
uh, physically, behaviorally, or intellectually with others. So students have the right to privacy. They have the right uh, to choose not to share themselves as part of research. We also have the idea of confidentiality, and this pertains to the treatment of information that an individual has disclosed in a relationship of trust with the expectation that it will not be divulged in others in ways that are inconsistent with the understanding of the original disclosure uh, without permission. And you want to define uh, confidentiality as part of your IRB. So with privacy, uh, you really address the idea of privacy inside the informed consent form. You tell subjects how, when, and why you're collecting data and that they can opt out if they don't want to participate in the study. Sometimes this might require explaining the context of why you are collecting certain data. For example, you might want to ask students how much alcohol they have over the weekends. You might need to clarify why you're asking this. It also relates to observational data. Um, so subjects should know they're being observed at the moment or not. It should not just be blanket permission to be observed. So remember, privacy is about the subject's own control over their own data. And subjects need to have the right, depending on the study, to know what data is collected, to know how that data is stored and protected, to be able to remove their data from the study, and to correct their data being used in the study. We also have to be concerned with confidentiality. And this is how we as researchers use and protect the data that we are given. We need to identify any potential harm to subjects if personally identifiable information is revealed uh, with them with the data that we're collecting. And so that determines the type of protection that is needed. The best way to protect your subjects is to not collect any PII. However, in some cases that might be challenging because we need the PII to, tape, to tie together data over time. But where possible, you should try to remove the collection of PII. And we also need to think about things that are indirectly identifiable PII. So anything that would allow for someone to deduce the subject uh, with reasonable effort. So for example, I collect a lot of data from uh, students' GitHub repositories. Well, I assign the students to repositories, so those repositories then become indirect PII for those students. So it's not just anonymizing the students in my data collection, it's also anonymizing the repositories in my data collection. We need to protect the data that is collected, especially if it contains PII. Uh, and if there's any chance that if disclosed, it could inflict some harm. And the possibility of harm should be discussed in the um, form consent for your study. So we need to talk about the collection, the storage, the analysis, and the reporting of data. So for example, we could create a key linking a student's identity to their data and maintain a master list of identity and key and keep that separate and independent from the data that we're actually doing our analysis on. We should consider storing encrypted data on secure servers, uh, removing identifiers when data collection is completed, and then reporting data in aggregate. Uh, and if we have any um, populations with small numbers, we need to make sure that we uh, maybe don't report on those populations. If you're in of a particular subgroup is less than five, it's probably not worth reporting on that information unless it's really getting to the particular research question. And even then less than five becomes really close to being identifiable or something that somebody could discern um, by looking at the data. So you wanna be very careful about that. Your informed consent forms are what lays out all of this information uh, for the subjects. So you can define all of those procedures uh, and how you might use the data in the future, such as in conference uh, papers and presentations. And it's also just really good to start thinking about this because NSF does require data management plans as part of grant proposals. So again, you wanna spell out who has access to the data, where exactly it's stored, uh, how you and other researchers on the team will use it, uh, and when you'll use it. Now, a lot of this can be automated, which is great because we're CS people, we know how to do that. So if you're using your gradebook as a data set, you could potentially create a script that will automatically replace students' uh, personally identifiable information with a uh, identifier, a unique key for them, and then would remove anyone that did not consent to the study. The uh, master key file is then locked away somewhere where only the PI can get to it. Now, please be careful where you can restore sensitive data. You wanna make sure you look at the terms of service for Google Drive, for Dropbox, or for other storages that you might be using. You also wanna make sure that you have control over the space where something is stored. 
uh, so that somebody else might not be able to get in and get to it. So investigate your institution. They probably have agreements and understandings and uh, really guidance about how to work with personally identifiable information and where that information can be stored. So for example, at NC State, we have a set of color categories that discuss the particular types of data and where they're allowed to be stored. So something like student grades is considered to be red data. Uh, it's not the most sensitive, but it's the next level down from that. But we are allowed to sort on our university uh, owned or uh, paid for Google Drive. So we are Google Apps for Education Institutions. So I am allowed to store student grade data on Google Drive as long as it's under my university account and it's shared with people who have accounts at NCSU. So those are things to uh, consider when you're working with types of data and most institutions have guidelines about what data can be stored where and how sensitive that data is. And you can use those guidelines when developing your data collection, storage and analysis plans. Now we are lucky because we do have uh, slightly less rigorous of a process to go through than say the medical field. When we are conducting our studies, a lot of us are conducting studies on regular classroom practice and that usually allows us to have a simplified IRB application. Now, when you are doing data collection, uh, particularly automated data collection or using automation to help with your uh, wrangling of the data and getting it to a point where you can actually do some analysis, that can be kind of interesting and that's going to be a pretty large task in and of itself. So you might want to think about the tools that you have available, uh, the time that you have to do this type of wrangling to help identify the best things that you can work with. So some things to look at would be online survey tools. Do you want to use Qualtrics? Do you want to use Google Forms? Do you want to use SurveyMonkey? Um, you could think about content management systems. Can you pull data out of something like Moodle or Sakai um, or other LMS systems? Maybe you want to use time tracking tools like Toggle uh, to have students keep track of time. You could use shared workspaces to collect data. Uh, there might be specialty tools for things like qualitative studies if you want to do uh, coding like in vivo. And you might create your own custom solutions. So maybe you want an Eclipse plugin that gathers student programming activities. Or maybe you want to do data mining of GitHub repositories over history and, and builds and, and collect data that way. So data wrangling, taking the sources that you have of data and transforming them into something that becomes useful to actually answering your research question is an important part of data collection and eventually getting to uh, the analysis piece. And so you need to be able to get that data into a usable form. Uh, and so we have a resource here that's from an REU uh, bootcamp that some colleagues and I used to run uh, where we had a data wrangling workshop. We'd take some messy data and we'd transform it into something useful to be able to answer a research question. And so if you want some tips and resources to get started with data wrangling, I encourage you to go take a look at our GitHub project for the science of software, REU. We have lots of references that you can go to uh, for instruments as well as some ideas for uh, the different types of data you might want to collect. So I encourage you to take a look at these as you start planning your data collection process. Thank you.